The photo that you see there is her, apparently her yearbook. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how um, she came to be. This is a little later, 1896, um, and you can see her signature. I saw her signature repeatedly. This lady wrote to her boss every day because she was out on the road visiting most of the counties in California. So imagine, you've done your work, and you go back to your hotel, and you're not done until you write a letter. There are at least 100 boxes of reports that she made regularly to her boss. So let me tell you a little bit more about her. And when I got ready to do this talk, I thought, it's been a while since I wrote that article. Uh, genealogy, as you know, has become a big deal. The last two Christmases, DNA gifts, kits, were the most popular gift. And of course, you do your DNA. You and I are related, but how are we related? So what you do is put together a tree. Well, the first thing I did was go on Ancestry.com. I typed in Harriet G. Eddy, and guess what? I found somebody else's tree that had her in it. And I thought, well, how's that? Who are they? So we carried on a correspondence, and the lady turns out to live in New York, and I had just invited her to this talk, so I guess she can watch it remotely. Then I built my own tree. And I'm accustomed, I guess since 2011, I've been teaching a class on genealogical information resources. This has been a real challenge. So you can see Harriet here on the left. If you go up, that's her paternal line. You may notice that her father's name is George Washington. Now you know, that would suggest that the family admires Washington. They, however, are from Canada. And I thought, so if they're from Canada, maybe we're looking at a, a loyalist. You know, there was a winner and a loser in the American Revolution, and a lot of families who lost moved up to Canada. Now I'm not quite so sure, and I can't even tell you who her grandfather is. Maybe it's Andrew. So is it any easier on the maternal line? Well, that line also goes into Canada. Of course, if you look at Mackenzie as a surname, that is a big hint. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. She's Scottish. But honestly, I can't, inter meaning what's called the genealogical proof standard, I can't even prove that that is her surname or her middle name. I'm, I'm, I just, I can't find a father to go with a mother Pierce, so I'm gonna guess that yeah, Mackenzie is in fact the surname of her maternal line. But, well, maybe enough of that, you know. How much does it matter where you came from? Those are products, it's an accident that we have these ancestors, we're here. What did she do with herself? Well, think about what a woman could do in the 19th century. What were the options? You could become a nurse, you could become a teacher, you might become a librarian. And she is born in um, Michigan. Her father at that point seems to be a lumberman. He's also a laborer, and you know how I'm telling you this, because he appears in the census. So I know a little bit about their circumstances. They're not well off. They're certainly not poor working class. And more importantly, they're willing to educate a child who is a girl. They send her uh, not too far off in Albion College. Uh, she prepares classical studies. Um, it looks like she would be preparing to be a teacher. Interestingly, she does go to the um, University of Chicago, and just as an aside, she was a member of a fraternity. Delta Gamma is one of the oldest sororities, but back then they referred to it as a fraternity, and I was so excited because they've got a good archive. I now can tell you all of the early DG um, secret handshakes, the songs, <laughs> But I never learned anything more about Harriet. I was hoping that maybe that chapter, the Zeta chapter, which is a pretty early chapter, might have, I don't know, some uh, things with the National Archives, but I couldn't find it. She goes to Chicago, which isn't too far away from her hometown in Michigan, and I don't really understand what happened. She's doing graduate work. Is she preparing for a PhD? It's not clear. But in 1903, she drops out, and she goes to Germany. 
I can't really prove what she's doing there. There are, there's some correspondence where she's writing back and saying that they do seem to understand my German. I can't say where she's actually studying. And part of this is there are over a hundred boxes at the state library. So if somebody gets hooked on this and they want to pursue it, I suppose in one of the boxes you can find it. So she's in Europe, she comes back home, and what could you do? She is going to teach. And that looks like a reasonable career path. But you know, as somebody said, life is what happens to you as things are going along. And so she does teach in what? Kansas, uh, it's Leavenworth. I think she's there because of a relative. Again, it's a little vague. Um, she's teaching in her hometown. And then she moves out to Montana to teach. But she ends up not too far away in Elk Grove, California. And she is the principal there. And as the principal, I think she is a really responsible principal. Because she's preparing these uh, children for life. One of the things she observes is that they really don't have a great library collection. And being a woman of responsibility, she writes a letter off be careful what you wish for. She wrote the letter to the state librarian, and there was something in that letter that really grabbed his attention. So let me tell you a little bit about the context. She didn't prepare to be a librarian. No, she didn't go to UCLA. She didn't go to Berkeley. Of course, back then, she probably, if she were going to be prepared in the best possible way, she would have joined Melville Dewey at Columbia College in New York or maybe a little later the New York State Library School. Most of the time, if you wanted to be a librarian, you found a good librarian and said, Jay's teaching what you know. You learned on the job. It is the progressive era now. So what that means is we do think that government can help make a difference. And so the legislature here in California is passing a series of bills the Library Acts of 1909, and it is very timely that in 1908 she has written this letter. So you know, behind the scenes, the bills don't just appear out of the blue. It means there are some people in the background who are helping draft the bill. So it's clear there's this movement, there's this thought that library service is a good thing, that we can uplift our community by building a collection that reflects the needs of the community. He invites her to talk at the California Library Association, and her talk must have gone over phenomenally. And don't. What do you wish for? Uh, so, the state librarian at this time is Gillis. Uh, Hiram Johnson is also the governor at this time. This is a progressive era where we're trying to make things better, and we believe that government intervention is a good thing, and that's actually controversial. Oh, that's kind of controversial today, too, right? So things haven't changed a whole lot in some ways. But she says that she wanted better library service. And as this bill is making its way through the legislature, think about this. If it's going to pass, we're going to need somebody to help organize county libraries in California. And who's that going to be? Gillis has got a problem. He's got to solve, and here is a woman writing a letter who's saying basically the same thing. Are these like minds? Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. I know she's registered to vote as a progressive. Now, I don't mean to say she's a chameleon, but the uh, folks in power are Republicans. Very shortly, her registration changes to Republican. But hey, maybe I would too if I want a job. This is how it works. Now, I think the really interesting thing about her personality really is her modesty. She writes much later about her own story. There's not a huge autobiography, there's no book that she wrote, but she does in a paragraph sort of sum up the situation that she was at this state library convention and Gillis uh, approaches her and asks her to help organize county libraries. And she's saying, but hey, I'm not a librarian, I'm not a nurse, I'm a teacher. And he said, so, you can teach, you can do it. And it seems so simple, I agreed. And 
why it's so important. You know, we live here in California, we take these things for granted maybe today, but back at the turn of the previous century, the idea of access to libraries outside of a, a major city is a relatively unusual thing. California becomes the model, not just for the nation, but hang on to that thought. This is actually probably the first county library, it's the WCTU branch, the Women's Christian Temperance Union Library, and it's right next door to where Eddie is. So some people would argue that this is a picture of what the first county library, not a city library, not an association library, but a recognized county library would look like. You've got to understand how they want to think about organization. It's called command and control. This idea, this concept is going to be very appealing someplace else in the world. But for the moment, let's talk a little bit about it. The command center is in Sacramento. And we're down here in San Luis Obispo. I live in LA. Where's Sacramento? It's up there, up north. What do they know? So you're going to find out that there's a lot of controversy about it. But the idea is that, well, hey, they've got the financial resources. Sacramento, I think, is the capital of this state. So the state library being right there, the legislature know what a state library should look like. And of course, they're representing, they came from someplace. They don't well, they lived there part of the time right in Sacramento, but they're representing their counties, their regions, and so maybe it would be a good idea to have the same thing at home that I enjoy here in Sacramento at the State Library. They've got the library materials, they've got professional knowledge, and they have a vision, and the vision is access beyond the cities. And you can look at California, if you ever driven in from Needles, it's a long way back into the state. So there are a lot of rural areas that don't have any kind of service. So the mission, five years, if you're willing to join me, Gillis is saying, I would like to help establish, and we've got the legislation now to do it, but you've got to go out there and convince him, her, those folks out there in the counties that this is a good idea. Yeah, maybe law, it's legislated for it, but the implementation isn't quite there yet, right? That's what's lacking. So the effectiveness at the county level, there's a big debate about the structure. Decentralization is kind of a nice thing. You know, if you work in a branch, I never see my boss because I'm the head of the branch. I get to do what I want to do. So if I'm part of a structure, maybe I don't like that. But that's the idea. So you're going to need somebody who can do close communication. And I don't know that I like the great communicator phrase, but Harriet Gietti certainly is that. She is a wonderful persuader, convincer, and I'll tell you more about what she does. And so she's always apparently available for ad hoc advice, consultation, you've got a problem. Hey, Harriet, she's seen it all. Talk to her, what she say. And what is so amazing, I mean, you can take the surf liner, right? You can take, how do you get around? You get in a car, oh wait. Henry Ford developed the Model T when? Yeah, so the, okay, technically the Model T's available, but how is she getting around? If she's gonna visit 40 out of the 58 counties, she's going by horseback, she's going by steamer. And there's some nice stories about her leaving Sacramento on the steamer. I know she enjoyed that, because she actually had, I won't call it a stateroom, but I know in a couple of her letters she talks about how nice it is to be able to just relax and be sort of taken care of and not have to fight to get somewhere. So she has in her correspondence a lot of stuff about how bad the roads are. And by the way, she is only 5'3". She is a mighty might. There's one, uh, one letter where she writes back to her boss, um, it's not even horseback. She's actually in a buckboard, and the driver that have, has been hired gets to the stream, and you know what happens. The horse sort of refuses. <laughs> He's ready to give up. She hikes up her skirt. She gets out of the buckboard, and she leads the horse through the middle of the stream. I'm going to get to work. You know, I've got to get out to San Luis Obispo, and how am I getting there? 
and I'm not going to take no for an answer from this guy who's hired to drive me there. So you just sit there and go, I know why she earned that nickname from college, a mighty mind. Wow. Or a Gillis girl. A lot of people called her a Gillis girl. So let's talk a little bit about San Luis Obispo. So if you were coming to San Luis Obispo in the turn of the previous century, where could you stay? What was available to you? So apparently between what, Palos Robles, Paso Robles, and Santa Barbara, the place to stay. I'd love to have stayed there. It looks really cool. Do you know where I'm talking about on Monterey? I was just there this morning. It doesn't look like this. It doesn't look like this when it was rebuilt nine months after it was next week. It burned down. I think it was up nine months. July 3rd, 1886, a fire burned it to the ground. So what did they rebuild it with? Hotel Andrews. This is where she stayed when she came to visit in 1914. Now, okay, there are cars, so clearly she could have gotten around in a car. Um, does this look more familiar? This was taken this morning. <laughs> uh, and here's the newspaper article that she, whoops, sorry, she's in town. She's representing the county library work of the state, and she's here for a few days. So what do you think she did for a few days? I don't know. Let's go out to some wineries. Uh, the farmer's market this morning was pretty cool. Far farmer's market. Yeah, I like the farmer's market. Yeah, we were there. I think my wife picked up a fair number of veggies and stuff. They look really good. But no, she's here for work. And it's just amazing what she does. So let's talk a little bit about the system, and I'll tell you more about what uh, she's going to do. So the county is being viewed as this unit, and the supervisors, ah, so here's where she's going to have to go. Is there a library board? Not quite yet. The law says we should have a trained certificated certificate. I guess she went to, I don't know, someplace and got a certificate. So you're supposed to be better trained than everybody else. Um, and the law says you're going to have a fixed salary, and the headquarters are going to be at the county seat of whatever this county is, so here is the city, that's where it's going to start. Mm -hmm. Branches are allowed throughout the county, and the union catalog, a union catalog was the way back then that we would say, we've got this resource and we can share it then within the county, so we can basically do kind of an interlibrary loan. That's the idea, but this doesn't exist yet. So what does it mean? It means that you're going to need somebody who is really politically talented, who can talk to all of the players. She's going to have to get a bunch of different groups on board to agree to set up a county system in these counties. It doesn't exist yet. So in terms of her own talents and her own characteristics, yeah, she's definitely politically um, astute because what she wants before she leaves town is she's going to have a letter from you. She wants a letter from you, a letter from you, and a letter from you. Who are you? The women's clubs. We know back then women hadn't quite, quite gotten the right to vote. So who is really influential? So I want to find the president of the women's club. I want her to call a meeting and I want to talk about the county library plan. And I'm hoping that at the end of my presentation, there will be a resolution passed that evening saying that the women's club of this county is on board. Same thing with the elected officials. What's she doing for several days here in town? You know she got up the next morning and she's talking to the mayor. She's going to talk to the town or city councils. She's going to talk to the county suit. How many days was she here? I can't imagine her schedule. And she just didn't do it here. She does it repeatedly in every county of 40 of them. I mean, but she's got a, wow. Can you imagine her travel expenses? She talks to the Attorney General. She talks to the Chamber of Commerce. The Grange, if you're an agricultural rural area, the Grange was a big place. People come together in the Grange, so let's see if the Grange can't sign off. Yes, we like the idea of having county library service. Well, the city, if it has a library board, I can meet with them, and again, at the end, wait a minute, 
The city library, do you think the city library is going to be enthusiastic about a county library? Isn't that kind of competition? We were here first by 25 years, maybe. Newspaper editors, oh, who are the largest taxpayers? I'm just amazed. She went after some really big rollers and got them to buy in to this vision that, yes, access to books, to the resources, to storytelling, to team rooms, this concept, she just is amazingly persuasive. Improvement clubs, men's business clubs, there are all kinds of people she would have tried to meet with and get a letter of intent before she leaves town. What an organizer. And I told you what she had to do to get through uh, to these different uh, places. Now, I do need to explain to you that she was pretty progressive uh, liberally, and she is involved with a controversy. There is an issue about Tom Moody. In 1916, the guy is serving prison, and there's some people who are persuaded that he did or didn't. What's your opinion? Did he or did I don't know. Maybe we'll never know. But she was convinced that he was imprisoned wrongly. So this is going to be a theme, and I think she stands up for the, what she perceives to be the right thing. And I'm going to come back to that because it's going to play a big part in the latter part of her life because she does have some political views which are not exactly popular at certain times. And she certainly expresses later in life some pacifist tendencies. But what does that all mean? What I really want to communicate right now is that she's out there organizing and she doesn't leave town until most places are going to sign on to it. But I don't want to make it out as, oh yeah, she just shows up, she does work herself to death. <laughs> uh, no, there are a lot of parties who are not quite persuaded. Is this really a good idea? It's a monopoly. One library in the state up in Sacramento? What do they know about us down here? What about being absorbed? Somehow we're gonna, our identity is vested in the institutions that we have here, and we're giving that up to somebody up there who's out of touch. Oh, what about graft and corruption, you know? That's a lot of money for library resources. You know they're not going to be buying books. They're going to be going out and having parties and doing other kinds of things with our hard-earned tax dollars. So no, it's not a good idea to have a county library system. Actually, at the end of this list, I'm amazed that we even have county libraries because I've tried to pull together all the arguments. Not that they were used all the time, but after she leaves, there are people who don't have a common vision. They don't have that mission of a county library. They are arguing that that's not a good idea for various reasons. Well, of course, your tax rates are going to go up, right? I always love Jack Benny, who said, I am proud to pay taxes, but I'd be just as proud to pay half as much. OK, that's a little later. But the point is, you know, what's a mill on a dollar? two cents on your appraised at $100. So, yeah, it is going to cost you something. It's not, I mean, we call it a free library system. It's in the sense that it's free that we don't charge you every time you come in and out of the door. You paid your taxes. You're a resident of the county? Come on in. <laughs> now I want to laugh. Does anybody think $2,000 a year is too much money? But that was an argument that the county librarians were going to be paid big bucks. And yeah, I'm the city librarian, and I'm going to make $1,500 a year. So you're, you have an opening at the county level. I just, I can, do I have to live in the county? No. Um, so maybe there was some jealousy, the city librarians. And yeah, the Gillis girls, that is a positive phrase or is that a negative connotation? So there is this suggestion that Eddie's, hey, you know, you know, you know, that's why you got appointed. You're just a friend of Harriet's. That it's not nepotism, what do you could call that? I mean, I always tell my students, it's not who you know, it's who you make the effort to get to know. That's what's really important here. And then for some of us, you live in the South or you live in the north, 
maybe we should partition California into two states, or the last one that didn't make the prop was we're going to have five states of California, right? Well, that was the thinking even, you know, a century ago, that there is this business, water's coming. So the, they would tie it to all kinds of arguments against having a county library system. Yeah, it's part of the Sacramento County Library machine. And of course, here it is, the outsider. I'm afraid, and that's fear-mongering. I don't know who she is. She, she didn't grow up here. She's from Michigan. She went to that. University of Chicago. I mean, you can think of all kinds of ways to label somebody as the other. But, but, yeah, let's, let's stay with the positive for the moment here. So, she does visit, essentially, 98% of the California population, and she, and of course, it's a whole team out of the State Library, are successful. Why are we here? Obviously, something happened, right? The supervisors of the county. And so, Joe has been working on the different dates. You can choose one. And so, I think it makes sense that, yeah, you'd celebrate when you have service. So, it didn't happen instantaneously. There was a lot of controversy about it, but it prevails. And today, it's just easy. I just assume everybody has service. In California? In the country now. This model, the California model, is what is used pretty much Florida likes to argue they were first. Okay, we can play those games. But the idea, the concept, is certainly very similar. So I guess I'll give Harry the credit for that. But things aren't all rosy, and it's very clear she prospers. I don't know, have you had a mentor in your life, somebody who promoted you, encouraged you? And when he dies in 1917, she decides that she has pretty much done what she needs to do to help organize California. So she switches over and becomes what's called the home demonstration leader for UC Berkeley's extension service. She's doing the same thing in a different role, going again to rural areas, trying to take the latest knowledge that's being developed in Berkeley and trying to apply it in those communities across the state. And she does that up until 1941. So you might think that that's the end of the story, right? Well, let's talk a little bit about someplace else that finds this whole idea very appealing. Not just the US, who's beginning to model the California plan, as it's sometimes called. There's a lady, Hopkina, who is one of the leading Russian librarians. And she comes, and if you're coming to the United States, you know where they go. They go to New York City, right? Or maybe Washington, D.C. Do they ever get out here to the West Coast? Less likely. But she does look at the New York Public Library, and she thinks, wow, if this is a library, that's not a bad idea. Maybe we could replicate the New York Public Library back home. And she also has the idea, she clearly is aware of Melville Dewey's school. She says, why don't we organize and let's start teaching women and men to be librarians. And so in Moscow, they start organizing. So she came again in 1926. So she's going to be one of the players. And if you want to read more about her impressions about uh, American libraries, you can read what she has to say. The important person who actually can make some decisions uh, in the new uh, Soviet experiment, we're going to build a new Soviet man, we're going to have a new kind of um, economy, is this guy by the name of Luna Charvsky. And he invites Harriet uh, based on a newspaper reporter who travels a lot to Russia. The guy uh, is on the Sacramento Star, and he wrote a lot about what Eddie was doing all over the state. He thought it was just interesting, I guess. And somehow, because he's respected in Russia, the commissioner of education says to this newspaper reporter, this idea about libraries and the regions, who should I be talking to? And he says, well, there's only one woman you should be talking to. That's Harriet G.A. So if you want to invite somebody to come, this is the lady who could do it. And so she goes for the first time in 1927, and that's a pretty long time. I got real interested. I've been to Russia 10 times. 
I thought, whoo, I've been to Russia 10 times. <laughs> I discovered Eddie's been living there for a couple of, what, six months, eight months? And she gets invited back a second time by this fellow. So I love uh, Russian to English translations. If you read this letter aloud, it doesn't quite parse right because it's written in Russian, translated into English. But nonetheless, he's trying to say that your authorized representers, is that means Harriet, um, it would be great for her to give a true representation of the effort. Let's talk to the horse's mouth, if you will. If she's the organizer of California County Libraries, why don't we hear from her? Um, and the government of workers and rustics. Um, yeah, so I won't bother you with the Russian translate, what the Russian actually says, but they're trying to indicate that they need libraries to help their rural areas as well. Terrible picture, but this is hers, of the All-Union Lenin Memorial Library. So where does she go when she's there in Russia? She goes to their New York Public Library. There are a lot of similarities in terms of the way you have a palace for the people. Uh, this library looks to me uh, in some ways like the New York Public. Of all the people you could meet, when I went to Russia for the first time in the early 90s, um, I met with the dean of the program in St. Petersburg, and somehow she said to me, you know, the name of the school is Krupskaya. I said, you named the school after Krupskaya? Isn't she like Lenin's wife? And the dean's thinking, this guy's an idiot. Yes, of course she's Lenin's wife. I had no idea how important Krupskaya was in all of this. Besides just being the wife of Lenin, um, she gets the heady. Eddie gets a chance to meet with her, and she is the one who has a philosophy about the role of libraries. There are these librarians who come to the U.S., but Krupskaya says, without a book, without a library, without the skillful use of books, there can be no cultural revolution for the reader. I love that quote. I mean, is it Soviet? Is it communist? Is it, I don't know, I just think it's what books can do to change, think about, I can't travel all over the world, but I can read a book and be transported there. I have a different view of things after I read a book. And that is the vision that Krupskaya has, and she had the ear of her husband. Now he's deceased, uh, what, 1924. But Lusharfsky is in charge of education for the country. And so there are all of these interesting women that she's meeting. Derman is also a very important player in this, as you'll see in just a sec. Now, after she has been there, he writes a letter back. And she says that he thanked me in the name of Russia for coming, said the suggestions would be followed as fast as possible. Doesn't this sound like a politician? Okay, it sounds good, it's indicative, but it's not informative. It doesn't say when, how much, how soon. I mean, it's just, it's kind of vague. Um, and so the plan is good for the Soviet Union and we'll adopt it yeah, as fast as possible. And what does she say? She's an organizer. She's not going to let that pass with a glittering generality. She said, it'll only happen if you send your best folks. You need to send somebody to see it for themselves and experience for themselves here in California. So, did he follow through on it? Yeah. He sent one of the best librarians he had. So she comes to California, and we know where she is. She visits enough different counties. Now, uh, the uh, governor, I guess, is now uh, a senator. He's in an influential position to help invite her. And uh, <coughs> she starts uh, thinking about what she's seen, and she writes, uh, toward an integrated and large library economy uh, in Moscow. So now she's experienced something in the United States which seems pretty unique, and she wants to take that home, and she's starting to share this idea. So we need to talk just a little bit about Russia and how things are organized. So just like us, they have cities, right? You know St. Petersburg, you know Moscow, maybe you know Vladivostok. That's a garode. 
But beyond the road, what do they have? We've got counties, they've got regions, and the word uh, rayon is the one that's closest, I guess, to what we would call a county. So this idea of trying to apply the California model to Russia is going to work because they do have these smaller uh, geographic rayons that would kind of map. And Putnam, there, there are a lot of people who still are arguing at our national level. Uh, Putnam, I think, is the Librarian of Congress. He's not so thrilled about this idea. But here is her effort in 1929 to organize. She tried, does this sound familiar? She tries to get the trade union libraries unified into the municipal system. The other municipal libraries into the rayon, that's the region. And then other libraries into this system. Command and control. This is a very similar idea. Maybe you can see why it appeals to the Soviets. Because they're trying to unify their country, they're trying to get mastery or control over regions, areas, outside of the major areas. Now maybe they've got a political agenda. I don't know, our libraries, do we have a political agenda? I don't know, I think we try to provide resources on all sides of a question. We try to reflect our community's values, the kinds of things. I wouldn't expect this library to look just like a library in, I don't know, San Diego County, right? Because there are differences. But nonetheless, they found this very appealing, and enough so, that they invited Eddie back another time to go take a look. And this time, let's teach the idea to would-be future librarians. So outside of Moscow, it's in a suburb, I, I visited there as well, and there's a really nice 29-page photo essay that she took talking about what it was like. I've also looked at where she stayed, and I don't know what she did but she was so persuasive that uh, a little bit later, they reserved an apartment for her in what's called the dome. Dome means home or house. So in Moscow, they were so enthralled, they loved her so much that they were hoping that if, hey, here's this apartment, it's got your name on the door, you can visit it today, you can actually see some of her things. She stayed for a bit, but I think she really wanted to come back home. But I just think it's fascinating that they were so in love with her that they would set her up and say, this is your place. Uh, although they're not supposed to be elites in Soviet Russia at that time, this is clearly a really nice setup. This is her institute. Uh, looks like a bus. Uh, but hey, by then that's the uh, 30s, so there should be transportation, right? And here is a write-up in the Riverside Daily Press about Eddie's trip to Russia. So even though she's the home demonstrator demonstration leader for extension, she's still getting publicity and write-ups um, uh, <clears throat> for her work uh, internationally. And yes, you could argue that Russia adopts the county library system because of one individual, Harriet G. Eddy. She writes an article herself about uh, all of this called The Beginnings of a Unified Library Service in the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It appears in a professional journal called the Library Journal. And you might think, hey, this is it, right? She lives happily, happily ever after, right? Well, we have an intervening war, right? Second World War. Uh, right after the war, um, she does travel to Yugoslavia. She travels to Bulgaria. She travels to Czechoslovakia. See anything interesting about those countries? What do they have in common? Russia. They're Russian? Yeah, but she's there ostensibly to help advance national library systems. She's still consulting. She's still traveling in the post-war era now that the war is over and she could do that. But she, unbeknownst to her, appears in the House Un-American Activities. Does this sound familiar? Do you know where this is going? What do you think is going to happen to her? This is 1944. Do you have a passport? How long is your passport good for? We just renewed it. 
10 years, right? Well, back then, it was only good for four years. So her passport was issued in 1948. So in four years, what's going to happen? It's going to expire. What's four years after 1948? 1952. You know what's going on in 1952? It's the Cold War. The Red Scare. Now, there is some evidence of her activism. If this is activism, she just agrees to sign a letter. And who isn't opposed to fascist? And closer cooperation with the Soviet Union. I mean, I don't know. You're supposed to keep your enemy. What's that, that cliche about keeping your enemies close to you? I don't know. But so she signs a letter. That's activism. You know, you ever write your congressman? You ever write the New York Times uh, a letter to the editor? It's going to be problematic. And so, yes, in 1952, the State Department, which is where you get your passport, decides that, in their opinion, your proposed travel abroad would not be in the interest of the United States. In the circumstances, your request for your extension, four years, right? It's up for renewal. Man, can you, I mean, we just take for granted. I send them a bundle of money, and depends on how much other applications there are, the processing takes, but you just, you just are, assume you're going to get your passport renewed, right? There's no question. So imagine getting this letter. It's pretty crushing. What is she doing? She's organizing libraries. Yes, she is organizing libraries in other countries. It's, yeah, say no more. Uh, so that is pretty much the end of her international career. Does she have a reputation, a legacy? Absolutely. Uh, there are at least a half dozen uh, obituaries uh, that appear in the papers around the Bay Area. Um, and yeah, you can see by the headlines what they're all focusing on. What are they doing? They're recognizing that she was the person who was behind the creation of California County Libraries, as well as the U.S. and internationally as well, in quite a few countries, as a matter of fact. So, I just think she's an extraordinary woman, but it's just sort of sad and depressing that she runs afoul in 1952, and she does actually take one more trip abroad, but it's for health reasons. She's looking for uh, a cure. So, but hey, she lives to be 90, which is a pretty good long time. She doesn't wish to have a funeral. She dies in December, and she says, um, to her executor, the instructions are that there be no funeral, but a celebration on her birthday in February. And then she also leaves some money to UCLA. Uh, Chase and I were talking about it. It was a four thousand uh, dollars shortly after her death, um, and apparently it was not an endowment, uh, but it was used to help students who were interested in preparing for librarianship in California. Well, what can we conclude from all of this? I think there are kinds of takeaways. You'll make up your reasons for why you might think she's important. I think one of the things is um, be careful what you wish for, you know? Writing a letter, she, I don't know what she really thought would happen. I can't believe she really thought that she was going to be the organizer for California libraries. I think she was genuinely interested as a principal that her kids deserved resources. But she was something else. Gillis certainly saw it. The California Library Association presentation must have, I don't want to say put the nail in the coffin, but that's a mixed metaphor. But the, the point is that you know she comes to the attention of some people who she can help solve their problems. And I have the greatest admiration for it. I just cannot believe anybody who could travel around and see, as I said, 40 out of 58 counties. I've had students who've, with their kids, gone to visit all of the um, missions. Has anybody visited? How many counties have you, I, we don't usually even think, how many counties have we been to? I can't, a dozen maybe, I don't know. 
Well, the Spoken Hub organizational structure, yeah, it is a centralized command and control, certainly did appeal to the, the Soviets' sense of central planning because they had these five-year plans, so it sort of fit right into, you can kind of understand why they would want this. But the things that we take for granted today aren't the things that we should take for granted. And I think this is why it's so important to remember, you know, at least every 100 years, <laughs> what's, uh, what's going on here. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank a bunch of folks who made it possible for me to come here today, uh, because I did have funding for uh, travel to know more. Ed Kucinich is the guy who asked me about Eddie. He said, you live in California. You know what the California County Library System is. And I said, I do. <laughs> so I do now. <laughs> uh, and yeah, up at uh, the State Library, the California History Room, have been fabulous. I would strongly encourage you to think about going. No, only in the sense that there are literally like a hundred boxes. There's a huge archive, because as I already said, she wrote to her boss regularly. And you sit there and go, oh my goodness. If you really want to know somebody, you can read her, what do we call That's a diary, right? A journal's intermittent, but she she's writing regularly. The registrar at Chicago tried to help me find her grades, her major advisor. Um, she really had worked with me. I still can't say that I know a lot about what was going on there. And there's a middle school in Elk Grove, and the librarian there actually has some materials because the school has named it her honor. So it was fun to go visit the um, Paige Berry, who helped me give this talk to them. So, have I told you everything you wanted to know? <laughs> what more could I tell you? Well, I have a question. Sure. Here she is traveling, all, going to all these schools. Yeah. What was her income? Where did she get the money? Well, she's paid by the state library. Okay. And so she's, and part of it is, man, she's got to keep records. She's getting reimbursed for her expenses. So a lot of the archive is because there are her expense records. So she was very aware of that criticism about graft and corruption. Because it sounds, I mean, my wife traveled a lot. And I thought, you know, abstractly in the 90s, oh, how glorious, you know, to travel and get to stay. It gets old. And she was doing this day in and day out. And not in conditions that, we've got air conditioning. I drove up here in three hours because there's a nice road. And she had a horse. She had a buggy, if she was really going deluxe, maybe a car, okay. And in, in the best circumstances, I guess, there were some really lovely things about her coming out of Sacramento on, I think it was called the packet steamer. So I guess she could come down the coast. But I don't know, I get seasick, so being paid to travel that way, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not a plus for me. But that's how she earned her, her income, from the state library. She didn't take kickbacks. <laughs> I don't know where you were going with that. Yeah, what else? Was this before the Carnegie Library? So Carnegie uh, is a big player in public libraries. So, you know, he made a lot of his money, people could argue, in not such a nice way. But one of the interesting things about America is that our rich robber barons, in the end, seem to give it all back. So yes, the Carnegie Library system is already up and running. So, mm -hmm. but, but that's city. That's city. Thank you. Okay. And by the way, that only gives you the building. And so I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but some people would say, well, that's nice. I've got a big building, but there's no librarian in there. There's no collection in there. There are no internet. Well, they would have had internet then, but you know what I mean. There are no services. So it's nice that I've got this building. And some people, of course, would say, and that building is blood money. So there are criticisms about Carnegie's gifts, but yeah, at least the cities have a new Stiffy library building because of Andrews. Yeah. She, uh, when she came to San Luis Obispo, yeah. she actually went to the Carnegie lady named Alice Hughes with the librarian. Mm -hmm. And she asked Alice if she'd be interested in being the county librarian at that time, which is very interesting. Uh, for our uh, distant viewers, this is uh, Joe, who is our local, can I call you what? What would you like to be called? 
unemployed. <laughs> I'm glad of it. Okay. But he's done a lot of work uh, on the local history here, and I hope in the near future that we'll be reading his work uh, about the details because he's been able to look into uh, this specific county and how uh, it came about with the system. We have on record um, uh, the same petition going from a variety of locations in the county mm -hmm. to the Board of Supervisors asking for the establishment of a county library. This is 1915. Mm -hmm. The exact wording in this petition. So Harriet was doing more than just having tea yeah. Yeah. with most a lot of the ladies. Yes. In 1919, there's another petition that goes to the Board of Supervisors. Exact wording about hiring a county librarian. Mm -hmm. And by time that happens, uh, it's before 1919, Harriet has retired yeah. uh, from uh, the county library. But she is a presence here, even though her name doesn't show up. You know she is, I would, the 10 boxes, I won't live long enough to go through all of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I can almost guarantee you there's going to be letters in there from a variety of people on, okay, now what's our next step? Yes. Okay? The yes. Women were plotting yes. and planning, yep. believe me. Yes. Well, you've heard, I think, and I know I've heard for like Africa and places where literacy is very low. If you educate a woman, you educate the village. And um, yeah, I would imagine she is, by the time she, every time she leaves a town, she's not only writing back to her boss, she's s cementing the relationship with whoever she's met there right. and doing follow-up. So that probably accounts for those hundred boxes mm -hmm. of letters. The Women's Improvement Clubs, they were called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Templeton, locally, is the, the last of them. They've all gone. But she, I noticed in groups she talked to, mm -hmm. that would be a key group of ladies. Yes. Because of course many of them, their husbands were on the Board of Supervisors. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were at City yeah. Council. That was pretty, pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. I'll stay if you want to talk one-on-one -on -one about anything. Well, thank it was my thank pleasure. You thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you.